Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Perplexity, a mystery podcast. I'm so happy you guys are here listening today. As always, I am your host, Kadra, and I am joined by my co-anchor, my (laughs) co-podcaster, my dog, Atreus. He's laying on the floor here in the closet with me. Um, Oh, nope, he wants to leave now, so we're going to we're going to let him out really quick. There we go. All right. Thank you guys so much for being here. I've got a really great story for you guys today. Before we get into that, though, as always, there are a couple of important housekeeping things that we do need to cover. If you like what you've been hearing on the podcast, please be sure to leave a five-star review. Take two seconds and hit the star rating option on whatever uh, platform that you're listening on. Remember, it's super easy. Just click the star rating option when you pull up the podcast. On Apple and Stitcher, it always gives you that option to type out a review if you want. So that's amazing if you want to do that. Leaving reviews really helps the podcast by boosting it up the algorithms that's what allows me to get these stories to more people. It's literally based off of ratings and ratings alone. So that's why I always ask each week. Uh, So for those of you who have already done that, it's, it's very much appreciated. You can also follow the podcast. So that way, you know, when new episodes have been released and you can share the podcast with your friends and family, put the link on your socials. I did want to give a couple of shout outs and thank yous to people. First, I wanted to shout out my old friend, Michael, who I've literally known since elementary school. And me and my boyfriend reconnected with him and his wife at the high school reunion. We just had our 10-year high school reunion this year. He has just been so supportive of this podcast. He's been constantly sharing the episodes on his Instagram and giving me feedback. And it's just been so appreciated. So, Michael... Your support has not gone unnoticed. Thank you so much. I also got a short but sweet five-star review on Apple, and they did take the time to write a little message. So Sferg87 says, quote, perfect for a mystery lover. (laughs) So that's awesome. Thank you so much for the review. I love that you're enjoying the podcast. Like I said, when you leave reviews, it does help me produce better content for you. So for those of you who have already done so, thank you so much. I couldn't keep this podcast going without you. I also wanted to thank my friend Abrin for buying me a coffee. And Abe says, keep it up with the jack-o'-lantern emoji. Thank you so much, Abrin. If you guys want to support and keep me caffeinated, check out my buy me a coffee link in each episode description. Uh, It's also kind of a way to tip your server. Just say, you know, hats off. I appreciate what you're doing. If you have topic requests for future episodes, or you want to share a crazy story with me that I would love to read on the podcast, email me at perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail. You can also follow me on Instagram for the latest updates, Perplexity Mystery Podcast. I also wanted to acknowledge some new Perplexity listeners in Italy and Austria. So hello, guys. Wow. Thank you so much for listening. There are 13 countries listening now. Thank you guys so, so much. If you missed last week's episode, you missed a wild one. I covered the mummy curse where we talked about the life and mysterious death of King Tut and the alleged curse of the mummy for those who dare enter his resting place. So definitely go back and listen to that if you missed it. Also, exciting news, I now have a YouTube channel, so if you prefer a slightly more layered experience, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's Perplexity Mystery Podcast. I am not video recording myself at the moment yet. With that being said, it is on my plans to start doing, so I'll keep you guys updated on that, but in the meantime, you know, if you like that slightly more immersive experience with the closed captioning and whatnot check it out on youtube so the mk ultra episode is now on youtube i don't think i'm going to go back and upload the prior episodes so i'd rather just do from here on out if that makes sense 
but I'll try to do that consistently. Okay, so sorry, I know that that was a lot of announcements. Uh, Last but certainly not least, before we get into the story, I did want to just shout out my friend Abby because she's an amazing artist and she designed my new artwork for the podcast. So if you saw that and liked it, that is the work of Abby. And you can check her out on Instagram at moxon underscore moxoff for all your artwork needs. So I'll put her Instagram at in the podcast description so that you guys can check her out. Trigger warning for today's episode. We will be discussing disturbing topics such as animal experimentation, abuse and violence, and germ warfare. So listener discretion is advised, especially for listeners below the age of 13. In July of 2008, 26-year-old Jennifer Hewitt was walking along Ditch Plains Beach with three of her friends in Montauk, New York. They were looking forward to a relaxing day at the beach and searching for a place to sit. This is when Jennifer and her friends noticed a crowd of people circled around some type of animal near the shore. The animal wasn't moving and appeared to be dead. The specimen had drawn quite the crowd, so curious, Jennifer walked over, and there she saw what appeared to be a decomposing creature that had the body of a seal, the head of a bird, the jaws of a predator with sharp canine-like teeth, and the legs of a raccoon. There also appeared to be some type of cloth or binding wrapped around the animal's right wrist, indicating that it could have been bound up at some point. It was certainly a mammal, but nothing like Jennifer or anyone for that matter had ever seen. So Jennifer snaps a photo and this would become known as the Montauk monster. This photo went viral and it freaked a lot of people out. I'll be sure to put the photos on the Instagram page, though I will warn you, they're quite disturbing. So anytime that something like this happens where an unidentified creature washes to shore that was clearly alive, it has become known as a globster. So the Montauk monster is a famous globster. And it basically means that we know it was alive. It's a mass of cells, but we don't know what the hell it is. So it's like a a blob or a glob or a monster. So hence the name Globster. And Globsters have been washing up on shores around the world for centuries. If you don't believe me, do a quick Google search, though you'll wish you hadn't. The photos are very upsetting. So with the Montauk monsters specifically, there's several theories on what animal it could have been and where it could have come from. So a lot of people think it could have been a dog, or a turtle, or a raccoon. But looking closely at the photo, it couldn't be a turtle because there are patches of fur that can clearly be seen on this creature, and turtles obviously don't have fur. The possibility of a dog would also have to be thrown out based on the appearance of the front paws slash arms because they have, like, small fingers. That's why in the description it said it appeared to have, like, the legs of a raccoon. Many other people find that the raccoon theory is hard to believe due to the beak-like appearance of the creature's face. So some people believe that this animal could have escaped from Plum Island, which is an island just 16 miles away from Montauk, where it was found. According to a New York Times article by Corey Kilgannon, quote, there have been comparisons to the H.G. Wells novel, The Island of Dr. Moreau, a nod from Hannibal Lecter in The Silence of the Lambs, and a murder mystery called Plum Island 
by Nelson DeMille in 1997, end quote. So Plum Island was, and still is to this day, a very controversial place, and it's known to perform experiments on a variety of animals, injecting them with diseases. And if this sounds familiar, I did cover something similar about the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center in Maryland, or BARC, back in episode three. And that was a large reason of how, like, the legend of the goat man came about. We hear stories like this throughout the United States, it seems. So to fully understand the history of Plum Island, we need to go back to the 1920s, specifically 1925. 1925 was when the Geneva Protocol came forth, which prohibited the use of chemical and biological weapons in battle. So because of this, the powerful countries of the world, such as the United States, had to get creative. This ultimately led to concepts like germ warfare or the use of bacteria and viruses to kill or incapacitate people and weaken their food supplies. When World War II began in 1939, countries had already started to weaponize infectious diseases. Examples would be the UK and Japan. They weaponized all kinds of things, but some of the most infamous ones would be anthrax and the bubonic plague. The United States had just finished dealing with the Great Depression, and we were pretty behind in this concept of germ warfare. And we knew we were behind, so fearing a power shift, this is basically when the U.S. rushed to get involved and learn about germ warfare. And facilities were built to test on livestock and crops. And one of them was the PIADC, or the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. So in 1945, when World War II ended, the research into germ warfare continued. The Soviet Union had become really powerful and the Cold War was ramping up. And again, US leaders feared a power shift. They feared that the communist nation would use germ warfare on Americans. So flashing forward to 1954, the PIADC was founded. And it was founded by the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. And Plum Island was a very small, remote island off the New England coast, just two miles from New York. So that was part of their rationale for choosing that location, is that it was, you know, pretty remote, secretive. And if anything were to escape, it would likely not spread because it would just, like the virus would just go into the water, essentially. So according to the Department of Homeland Security's website, the purpose of the PIADC is to serve as the nation's premier defense against accidental or intentional introduction of transboundary animal diseases, aka foreign animal diseases. So this would include foot and mouth disease, also known as FMD, and African swine fever, also known as ASF. So the PIADC is pretty special to the United States as it is the only laboratory in the nation that can work on live foot and mouth disease. And the lab and its staff of nearly 400 employees provide a host of high impact indispensable preparedness and response capabilities, including vaccine R&D, diagnostics, training, and bioforensics, among other things. So that is just according to the DHS. The center is known to conduct research on animal pathogens as well to protect farmers, ranchers, and the national food supply. So they've spent many years focusing on FMD, foot and mouth disease, because it's highly contagious. And if there were to be an outbreak of FMD, it would be absolutely devastating to the livestock population. So because these diseases are so highly contagious, 
And because FMD can be spread through the air, contact, and clothing, there have to be extreme safety precautions at this facility. So this is again part of why it's on an island. And when surveyors assessed the region, and they decided that Plum Island was, you know, a good place to build, they did find, too, that the prevailing winds blew out to the Atlantic Ocean. So, again, those germs would likely head out towards open water if there was an outbreak. But from the moment this facility was built, many New Yorkers were outraged and concerned because they feared this new facility would result in increased pollution, and also it could be putting their lives in danger if there ever were an outbreak. So eventually military funding was withdrawn from the facility because they stopped seeing the benefit of germ warfare research, and the facility became exclusively owned and operated by the USDA. This also meant that the facility was now only supposed to study how to cure diseases, and they were no longer supposed to study how to weaponize them. Now, some people believe that the military never actually backed out uh, and defunded the PIADC. Some people believe that they stayed and that this research continued. It just became more secretive, and we'll see more theories related to that later. So let's keep going. Dr. Maury Shihan was the first director of the PIADC, and Dr. Shihan recognized how dangerous their work was, so he was very cautious. They had very tight security. There were about 400 employees at that time that he basically handpicked, and he didn't allow anyone to enter the island unless they were employees. It didn't matter how important they are. It could be the president of the United States. He was not allowed if he wasn't uh, an employee. <laughs> so employees also could only get to work by ferry each day because it's on an island. And when the employees would arrive to the facility, they had to immediately remove their street clothes and shower. Then they would change into coveralls and white sneakers. And those coveralls and sneakers had to remain on the island at all times. And employees also had to shower at the end of their shift. Sometimes employees would shower up to 10 times per day in order to avoid cross-contamination. Throughout the day, experiments would be done primarily on cows, goats, and pigs. Cows were given paralytic drugs that would leave them paralyzed for hours. Disease-ridden animals that had succumbed to their illnesses were euthanized and sent down a chute into an incinerator. So during Dr. Shahan's time as director, there was never an outbreak as far as we know, and the facility remained very safe. But Dr. Shahan retired nine years later, and a new director named Jerry Callis stepped in. Jerry had been an employee at the PIADC for some time, so he wasn't new to working there, but he did have quite a different approach to running things compared to Shihan. So Jerry basically was like, this place feels too cold. It's not welcoming enough. Never mind they were torturing animals by injecting them with diseases and euthanizing them. He wanted it to be a place that makes people feel at home, I guess. So he started putting like flower beds in and he became really lax on protocols. So he would have all these landscapers come. He allowed visitors. He even had a neighbor's niece and her classmates come and tour the facility. <laughs> And so on September 15th, 1978, there was a lab technician named Billy Dorosky, and he ferried into work that morning. He had been out drinking the night before, so he was hungover, and his job was to inject animals with virus samples, draw blood, and examine the facility's livestock. That particular day, 
the PIADC was hosting a seminar on the bovine herpes mammillitis, mammillitis virus. And during the meeting, Jaroski was supposed to inject this virus into a group of cows to later be observed. But when Jaroski entered the room that the cows were being held in for this experiment, he made a startling discovery. So these cows had clearly been infected by something. They had drool and foam dripping from their mouths. Their mouths and feet were covered in blisters. And so Jaroski's obviously really confused. And since he was hungover, at first he thought he had walked into the wrong room. But he gathered himself, he double-checked the assignment on his clipboard, and he did in fact realize he was in the correct room with the correct cows. So he notifies his superiors, and within hours, they pulled samples and identified the disease that was infecting the cows wasn't herpes, which was the disease they were supposed to be injected with. It was their worst fear. The cows had foot and mouth disease. There had been an outbreak in the facility. So the director, Jerry Callis, decided to follow the PIADC's written protocol, and the employees also had to turn over all of their belongings to be destroyed. The only things that they could keep were their car keys and glasses, and they would have to get bathed in, the, like those items would have to take an acid bath before they could have them back. The employees were also all given new clothes, and they were ushered into small containment rooms to await further instructions. The employees waited there for hours, and eventually Callus informed the employees they could go home. <laughs> So a 35-man cleanup crew had to stay behind, making a list of the animals on the island, which consisted of 94 cattle, 7 pigs, 66 lambs, 28 rabbits, 27 chickens, and 6 horses. So the animals were all ushered onto the killing floor, where they were all incinerated. One worker described the smell as roast beef left on high heat for eight hours and then left out rotting for eight more. Horrifying. So every surface on the island then had to be disinfected, and this took three days to get the whole island scrubbed down. And Callus also notified the media, which I'm kind of shocked about, but <laughs> Callus notified the media, making a statement that Plum Island had had their first outbreak. But when the USDA gets word of this, they order Callus to stop calling it an outbreak because they don't want to alarm any civilians. So the staff were then instructed to call the event the incident. So after this, officials did a thorough investigation, but despite their efforts, they could not figure out how this FMD outbreak happened in the first place. And this is also when Plum Island's reputation became permanently soiled. Callis knew that in order to keep the facility up and running, they needed to ramp up their research more, and they needed to make a big discovery. Dr. Howard Backrack, an employee for the PIADC, got to work, and in 1981, he actually found a cure for FMD through a vaccine. So this was a huge scientific breakthrough, as it was the first vaccine to ever be developed through gene splicing. A few years later, the president at the time, actually, Ronald Reagan, gave Backrack the National Medal of Science Award. So it was a pretty big deal, but this wasn't enough to buy in the general public and the general consensus of the scientific community as well continued to be negative in regards to the Plum Island. In fact, the National Academy of Sciences released a scathing review about the PIADC. They said Backrack's discovery was just an anomaly and that the facility had made minimal contributions to the scientific community, 
much too minimal to justify the extremely high cost to run this place. And they even recommended that the facility be shut down for good. Just one year later after this report, the PIADC's funding was cut by 5%. A few days later, the USDA forced Jerry Callis to retire, and he had been the director for 25 years. So then when this happens, a new director is brought in, a dude named Roger Breeze, and this was in 1987. And Roger Breeze was cutting corners and cutting costs almost immediately. (laughs) He didn't see the benefit of having overstocked supplies and didn't see the point in having landscaping. So those things immediately stopped. A lot of people also got laid off. And even worse, repairs were often not done at the facility unless they were deemed absolutely necessary. So, in 1991, the Burns and Rowe Services Corporation purchased a contract with Plum Island. So, while the facility was still technically part of the government, a private business had now become involved. Which is very controversial, because (laughs) the government's job is to serve the people. Whereas, a private corporation can pretty much do whatever they want. So... After this change, Plum Island seemed to have a major shift, and it became more focused on making profit. Hundreds of employees were laid off at this point, and the employees' numbers decreased from 400 to somewhere around 100. Around midnight on August 18, 1991, 44-year-old Philip Pagari rode the ferry to Plum Island for his shift on the maintenance crew. His job was to ensure that the building had proper airflow and that the negative pressure system was functioning properly. He also did regular maintenance work on the freezers throughout the facility. At Plum Island, dozens of dangerous diseases were kept in vials in freezers. In order for the diseases to remain dormant and not latch onto a host, it was absolutely paramount that the freezers be kept at a specific temperature, minus 158 degrees Fahrenheit. So when Pagari rides in for his shift, it's a dark, stormy night, and the weather report warned that a hurricane was coming. This would later become known as Hurricane Bob. A hundred mile per hour winds resulted in a power outage and the facility went dark. So normally, (laughs) the facility had, like, backup power with an underground cable. But this cable was damaged three months earlier, and genius new director Roger Breeze decided it wasn't worth paying for the repair. And so (laughs) when... They had the facility running on power. It was running on emergency power for the last three months. So when this hurricane shoots the power off, it's off. And there's no fixing that. No backup generator, nothing. So the animal's waste on Plum Island was normally drained into this two-tank system. And so when the power goes out, the tank won't open because it runs on electricity. So as a result, the emergency valve to this tank opened and animal waste spewed out all over the floor of the facility. And as if that wasn't bad enough, keep in mind, these animals are disease-ridden. Then an alarm starts blaring, warning that the freezers were no longer at their required temperature. So this would result in all the diseases inside the freezers becoming active, attaching to air particles and searching for hosts. When Pagari ran to the freezers, he saw the specimens dripping onto the floor. So Pagari and his other coworkers did the only thing that they could think to do. 
they grabbed mops and they attempted to push the waste and the specimen liquid into wastewater drains. Eventually, the hurricane blew past and the employees went home. A month later, the maintenance crew, including Pagari, received letters from the USDA thanking them for their hard work. But then the same day, they were informed they were being laid off. So not long after this, Pagari came down with a mysterious illness. And none of the doctors that he would see could figure out what was happening to him. They would run all these tests and it, they were inconclusive, basically. So Pagari reached out to Plum Island for help, asking if they could test his blood and basically see if he had gotten the disease from the facility and if they could identify the disease. The facility never got back to him. And his symptoms persisted for six years. So eventually, his symptoms dissipated. So I don't know what was significant about six years, but this poor man was sick for six years and got no answers. In 2000, Plum Island also started doing work on human diseases, such as smallpox and polio. After 9-11, on September 11th, 2001, a lot in the United States changed in terms of security. So there were a lot of concerns about our nation's security, including at places like Plum Island. There were fears that someone might try to steal certain pathogens from the facility to conduct bioterrorist activities. So the president at the time, George W. Bush, reorganized the federal government. And in 2003, the DHS, Department of Homeland Security, was put in charge of Plum Island. And they are still in charge of them to this day. So security ramped up on the island with armed soldiers, ensuring that nothing got in or out. People began to speculate about what exactly was going on inside Plum Island that would lead to this much security. These fears would later be validated because in 2008, a woman named Afia Sadiq was arrested in Afghanistan. And in her possession, there were maps of New York and a list of potential targets for Al-Qaeda to attack, including the Statue of Liberty, Times Square, the subway system, and Plum Island. So I think now is a good time to get into some conspiracy theories. So going back to the Cold War again and the Soviet Union, one conspiracy theory is that Nazi scientist Eric Traub was employed at Plum Island. Which for those of you who listened to episode 14 about Project MKUltra, we know that this is plausible. In episode 14, I also briefly talked about Operation Paperclip, a United States intelligence program in which more than 1,600 German scientists, engineers, and technicians were taken from former Nazi Germany to the U.S. government for employment between 1945 and 1959, after the end of World War II in Europe. So knowing that this happened, is it entirely out of the question that the government could have employed someone like Traub at Plum Island? After all, during this time, Plum Island was openly doing research on germ warfare, and Eric Traub worked directly under Hitler's second-in-command, and during his time working with the Nazis, he had researched ways to cripple their enemy's food supply. And in the 1940s, Traub's research paid off. When Germany invaded Russia, bombers reportedly sprayed foot and mouth disease on cattle and reindeer. Allegedly, Traub also sailed to the Black Sea in search of Rinderpest, a disease known as the Cattle Plague. And Allied forces uncovered weapon caches, secret nerve agents, and Hitler's alleged plan 
to bring about another wave of the bubonic plague. A Polish lab technician also found a list of names stuffed down a toilet bowl at a local German university. Making its way up to the chain of command to American and British military leaders, it was discovered that this list contained the names of 15,000 scientists who worked for the Third Reich. The U.S. had a choice. They could track these people down, and they could charge them for war crimes, or they could hire them and get their technology. <laughs> so what did we do? Hold people accountable? Of course not! Let's just use them and steal their stuff. Come on, guys! <laughs> oh, it's so messed up. So, of course, among the lovely names on this list was the scientist Eric Traub. <sighs> and even though his name was technically never listed as an employee at Plum Island, many people believe he worked there. Some people allege that when he was interviewed by the U.S. government, Traub proposed the idea of building animal disease research facilities for germ warfare in the first place. We also know that Traub was offered a job at Plum Island in 1952 by Dr. Shahan, but he allegedly turned the position down, returning to Germany a year later. But then, later, Traub was seen visiting Plum Island many times while Dr. Shahan was still director, the very first guy. He was seen at Plum Island's opening ceremony in 1956, and he visited the facility several more times. And remember, Dr. Shahan had very strict protocols. Only employees were allowed on the island. So why would he be allowed on the island if he wasn't employed there, you know? A USDA memorandum was also discovered from 1958 titled Justification for Employment of Eric Traub. It was also common at this time for the PIADC to change names of employees on payroll in order to protect their identities. So some people think this was also an attempt to hide identities of military personnel being on payroll, since the military was supposed to have backed out of Plum Island by then. While there's technically no definitive proof that Traub was employed at Plum Island, I think it's certainly plausible, considering what we know has happened historically and there's also a lot of circumstantial evidence, and then of course, the memorandum for his employment. So that's the first major conspiracy theory. The second major conspiracy theory about Plum Island is that this is where Lyme disease was invented, and that it was unleashed on citizens in the nearby town of Lyme, Connecticut. So that is how Lyme disease got its name. A citizen of Lyme, Connecticut, named Polly Marie, became very concerned when her 12-year-old son had been bitten by a tick and became very ill, with large red circles on his arms and legs. Shortly after, Polly's family came down with the same symptoms. This was also happening to Polly's neighbors and dozens of others in the same area. The symptoms persisted for weeks. Another woman from Lyme named Judith Minch also came down with the mysterious illness. So Polly and Judith phoned the Connecticut Department of Health describing their symptoms, and they also called Yale University. Yale doctors provided a temporary diagnosis, rheumatoid arthritis. But the majority of the people they examined were children, and this diagnosis would be very uncommon in children. So the doctors continued to search for a more appropriate diagnosis, and eventually they discovered all of the patients had been bitten by a deer tick. 
an official from New York's Department of Health, did further research after hearing about the mysterious illness and eventually discovered the illness had been spread by deer ticks in the area. The illness eventually became known as Lyme disease, L-Y-M-E, in 1975. Some people believe that because Lyme is just 11 miles from Plum Island, the disease could have been carried from the island to Connecticut. If even just one tick had reached Connecticut from Plum Island, it could have caused an outbreak. Plum Island director Jerry Callis had also admitted before that Plum Island studied ticks. Not only this, but they had a huge problem at the island where deer were often known to swim in the area. So it's plausible that a deer could have swam back and forth without being caught, especially since they only had a skeleton crew overnight. Author Christopher Carroll, who did a lot of research on the PIADC, also claimed to have stumbled upon internal government documents detailing unsafe work conditions on Plum Island, including large holes in some of the laboratory's roofs for increased airflow. This meant insects could get in and out. And this leads into our third conspiracy theory that Plum Island scientists created the Montauk monster and perhaps it escaped. So after Jennifer Hewitt and other New York locals had stumbled upon this creature on Ditch Plains Beach, less than 20 miles from Plum Island, it mysteriously disappeared. Some articles claimed an unidentified man took the body away. We learned earlier that the lab incinerated euthanized animals. So theorists have wondered if the Montauk monster was one of the animals marked for the incinerator, explaining the binding on its arms. Knowing that there were safety conditions on the island, like holes in the roofs, it's possible the creature could have escaped and died eventually drifting to shore. Some people speculate that the Montauk monster wasn't real at all. It was a fake placed on the beach as part of an advertising campaign. Or perhaps it was a majorly decomposed and disfigured body of another common animal, such as a dog or a raccoon. One year after the incident, an unnamed source allegedly came forward claiming he created the Montauk monster. He said he and his friends were partying on the beach nearby and they found a dead raccoon. They said they picked up the creature and placed it on an inflatable rubber duck. Then they set the duck and the raccoon on fire, giving it a quote, Viking funeral and pushed it out to sea. And if that's not lad behavior, I don't know what is. <laughs> it's so douchey. So the Montauk monster was found two weeks later after this event on Ditch Plains Beach. And this could explain why the remains of the creature seemed unrecognizable because it had been burned. But it is important to note, this is not the only time that something strange was found near this area. Two years later, on January 14th, 2010, a security guard of Plum Island discovered a human body on their facility shoreline. The person was six feet tall with a large build, estimated to be between the ages of 60 and 70 years old, African-American, and had strangely inhumanly long fingers. Some people wonder if the security guard stumbled upon another Plum Island experiment gone wrong. The corpse still appears to be unidentified at this time as well, so pretty creepy. While the PIADC's headquarters at Plum Island are scheduled to be shut down this year in 2023, 
They will not be stopping their research. They're simply relocating to Kansas. I guess they weren't worried about diseases potentially spreading inland anymore. There's there's no water at all in, in Kansas. At least not enough to protect something like this getting out. There have been rumors of what Plum Island will be turned into. A nature sanctuary, a park, or maybe even a Trump golf resort. Goody. According to a New York Times article by Corey Colgannon, Plum Island is, quote, located 100 miles east of New York City with sweeping water views. The island has already drawn unsurprising interest from local real estate agents and developers, including, yes, Donald J. Trump, end quote. But with deadly diseases being studied and contained in this facility, such as foot and mouth disease, one misstep could prove disastrous for the U.S. economy and millions of animals could die. According to the Department of Homeland Security, in 2001, the United Kingdom had an outbreak of foot and mouth disease that resulted in an economic loss of approximately $8 billion, with a B, dollars, and the slaughter of more than 6.2 million animals. FMD is a disease of economic importance because to freely export agricultural products and conduct foreign trade, countries must be considered free of FMD. An FMD outbreak in the U.S. would be absolutely devastating, with a cost estimated at 20 to $60 billion. According to the DHS, the PIADC is the only federal lab permitted to work with live FMD, and more than $25 billion in U.S. economic losses have been avoided by prevention of African swine fever outbreaks. So it sounds like they're obviously doing good work, but when you have anybody dealing with diseases, especially at this capacity, it's just, it's so paramount to follow precautions, you know? And then moving everything inland freaks me out, especially just thinking about them having to take those freezers and those diseases, take those animals and move them. I mean, that's what I'm assuming. I would assume they wouldn't destroy their samples and stuff like that and move it all inland, but who knows? The PIADC is a global leader in dangerous foreign animal disease, vaccine development, and diagnostic testing. But unfortunately, with its controversial past and known history of cutting corners and cutting costs, I must say I'm skeptical about how much we should trust the PIADC, especially with the possibility that they're creating monsters. And that is the crazy story of Plum Island and the Montauk Monster. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for sources that I used and for ways to support the podcast. Remember, if you've been enjoying the podcast, leave a five-star review, follow the podcast, share it with your friends and family. You can always send topic requests to me or tell me a crazy story of your own. I love to hear from you guys. You can DM me on Instagram at Perplexity Mystery Podcast, or you can send me an email, perplexitymysterypodcast at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you guys. Thank you guys so much for listening. I can't wait to talk to you guys next week. And be sure to tune in next week. It's going to be a real good one. I will be bringing on my very first guest. Bye, guys.